I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Central America, specifically in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I had a question about uh, why do areas that have tourists tend to have so much more crime and does the tourism industries actually create the crime that we see in so many places, specifically places like Mexico and Guatemala, but perhaps also within Nicaragua, for example, places like Granada and San Juan del Sur have way more crime than normal parts of the countries. Is this being caused by the tourists? Is it ancillary? Is it completely coincidental? Incidental, what is happening? And I think that's a great discussion and things that people should think about, of course. So we're going to talk about that right after the bump. All right, so let's kick off today's question by actually just reading the question as it was sent in so you know exactly what our uh, context is. So Gooch Gooch CC7SJ said just a little bit ago, have you considered that the tourists slash expats are the reason for the increased crime in Guatemala and Mexico? Look at the amount of crime in the touristic areas of Nicaragua as well compared to the rest of the country. Is the tourist expat appetite for drugs cause this? causing this, I think? Is it the fact that they are easy picking? So. That's a great question, right? What? But so let's start by looking at a global context. Where is the world epicenter of tourism? Well, that is for sure the Mediterranean of Europe. That's Spain, France, and Italy. And if there's one thing that those countries are known for, it is an incredible lack of crime, both violent and just traditional crime. Like crime is very, very, very low in those countries. And it's it's actually mind blowing just how safe they are from, you know, violence is low, homicide rates are low, even snatch and grabs and pickpockets are low. Now the pickpocketing is a little bit higher, right? So, you know, coming from the United States, pickpocketing uh, is a little bit lower than a lot of Europe, but that's because violent crime is so much higher. If you pickpocket someone in Europe, the chances that something really bad is gonna happen to you, yeah, the police might catch you, you could get in trouble for sure sure, but the penalties for that are reasonable. If you get caught by the police pickpocketing in the United States, generally it's about the same. But in the United States, the chances that someone is going to have a weapon or just aggressively try to harm you in uh, an interaction where it's just a, a you know, simple snatch and grab are much higher than in Europe. And so that discourages that really low level of crime, but of course engenders a much bigger type of crime. So it's not a win, but it does create a little bit of, of, of benefit. So Europe does have a little bit more of pickpockets, but they're also very conscious of it. But Europe also has way more tourists. So tourists in any given spot do create additional crime. If you go to Spain, France, uh, Italy, and you go to the places that have the most tourists, you also have mostly the most crime. It's not 100% true, but it's generally true, right? Rome actually doesn't have as high a crime as Naples, but it does have higher tourists, so it's not exactly a direct correlation, but in general, tourist areas always have a little bit more crime, but almost always, anywhere in the world, it is non-violent crime. It is rare that you get violent crime where tourists are because two reasons. One, the people who are committing crimes have very little benefit to committing violent crimes against tourists. It doesn't get them anything. And two, governments and regional authorities and individual uh, companies and businesses tend to be very, very protective of tourists because they bring in tourist dollars and it only takes a little bit of crime to drive them away. And so they tend to be very protective of that. Famously, there's an example where China had someone uh, have their backpack be stolen. This is a number of years ago. This is not a current thing at all, but they had their backpack stolen and they reported it and the police tracked the guy down and the penalties that he served were severe. Severe to a point where no one in their right mind would ever try snatching a backpack again and the person actually got their backpack back. And they said in the article, this is easily 20 years ago, had I known how severe the penalties would have been, I would never have reported my backpack stolen. But to the Chinese government's viewpoint, someone stealing someone's backpack that's a tourist represents a potential uh, eroding of tourist faith in the Chinese safety mechanisms. And so they have to shut that down because in an economy at the time, which was much poorer than it is now, the loss of tourism could have represented a loss of income for a lot of people, which in turn could have led to people starving to death, for example. And so in a way, it's indirect, but stealing a backpack from a tourist could have led to a child starving to death. And that would be seen as murder in certain viewpoints. And so the penalty for that could be quite severe depending on how it's looked at. So eroding faith in an economy is a, can be a really serious thing. If you do that in the United States, probably no one's going to starve to death uh, because you stole something from a tourist. 
but you don't know that they're not. You don't know what the knock-on effects of something like that are. So generally countries, one way or another, take their tourism really seriously. And especially if you're in a place where it's a, an important part of your economy. There's some places that just have very little tourism and they just don't care because they just have no way to get it right. Yemen is not particularly looking out for their tourists because they have so few of them. But generally, most countries look after their tourists quite a bit. So the idea that you're going to have violent crime where there are tourists, very unlikely. Violent crime generally works uh, where you're somehow threatening or scaring a local population. So you're working in kind of an anonymous mode or you are uh, actually uh, carrying out attacks against specific people. And those specific people would rarely be tourists because how do you know those tourists if you're there to do that? So, so it's really rare to experience violent crime where tourists are like just that's the world over. And so if you look, you, you like Barcelona in Spain, yes, you're going to have more pickpockets than you're going to have in, uh, somewhere in Galicia, but you are not going to, um, have, have violent crime. Just, it just doesn't make sense for, the, for anyone involved. So the question then is, what about here in Nicaragua? What, what do we see play out here in the country? Well, it's pretty much what is predictable, right? In general, Nicaragua is a very safe country, very, very safe. And where we do have crime, very little of it is violent. But when it does happen, there is a trend towards it happening in tourist areas. But of course, there's a lot of reasons behind this. Now, when we say the reasons, of course, we don't know the reason for every individual crime. And there are lots of reasons that uh, we could be wrong, right? So these are these are theories, right? So don't don't come down like, you don't know this is true. I don't know this is true. Before I do that, one thing I want to say about Europe. One of the things about Europe is that it's a very rich area. And so the tourists who are visiting Europe are often of the about the same income level, on average, as the Europeans who are there. It is rare that you have tourists who in any number are wildly richer than the people that they're visiting. Um, and in many cases, the people visiting places like Barcelona or Rome, it is normal for the majority of tourists to be poorer than the people who live there uh, normally. So that is that is a factor as well. Here in Nicaragua, so we find that Granada and San Juan del Sur are the most likely places to have crime, plus of course the poorest barrios of Managua, as should go without saying in a large city, poor areas it happens, and some of the Mosquito Coast does have some problems with crime. Remember, overall, our crime is very, very good. So when we say there's problems, we're still not talking about bad areas. It's nothing like St. Louis. It's nothing like the south side of Chicago. It's nothing like Baltimore. It never happens like that, right? But we're saying from a Nicaraguan perspective where we're used to it being so safe, these areas get a little bit more, you gotta, you gotta pay attention, right? I'm not saying don't go there. I'm not saying like, watch your back. I'm saying like, don't be an idiot, right? That's, that's all we're saying. But so in these areas, there is a little bit of increase in crime. Why do we think that that is? Well, one, there are a lot of tourists. So these are all tourist zones that we're talking about. They have tourists and there has a, there's a very big tendency in Nicaragua that your tourists tend to be very focused on alcohol and drugs. Not that you're coming to Nicaragua specifically for drugs, but these tend to be backpacker crowds, especially in San Juan del Sur, but Granada gets this too. You tend to get a lot of retirees and a lot of people are here. It's the tropics, right? Why do you go to the tropics? Well, coming from American Canadian culture, standard reasons to go to the tropics are to sit on the beach and get wasted. They don't have any particular plan when they're coming here. They're coming here to drink and dance and live music. And that's what Nicaraguans do at night too. So they're, you know, partially just taking part of the culture. And that means you have tourists who don't know the area, who probably don't speak the language, who don't know what they're doing and are very likely drunk. And I have been to parties in San Juan del Sur and the chances that someone has smuggled in drugs from Costa Rica are very high. And so you have a lot of people doing things that are illegal. They may not want to go to the police because they've been doing something illegal. They're possibly, you know, just high, and that makes them more of a target as well. And so that just makes it more, but you're not so likely to get stabbed. You're more likely to just get robbed, right? Or pickpocketed or whatever. But there's a small amount of individual violent crime that can come in those situations. If you're trying to steal from someone who's drunk and they put up a fight, sometimes something happens, but just still, there's really no guns here. So it tends to be, you know, knives or, or fist fights or that kind of thing. There are exceptions, but in general, that's what we're looking at. And the same thing happens in Granada to a lesser extent. Part of the problem in Granada was that a major tourist area was unlit for a number of years. And so there was a really dark area with a lot of tourists in it. That's just foolish. They fixed that. And I think the crime has probably dropped a lot. That was a major problem for a while. Just too many tourists in completely dark areas. People could like hit you in the back of the head with a rock, take your money, and no one would ever know someone was there. You'd be like, I heard something in the darkness. And in the morning, they find you laying there like without your wallet. And you're like, I have no idea, you know, rock in the darkness. So that was a problem, um, but that, that has been fixed years ago. 
Oh, so, but it has a, has a bit of a reputation from that. But that's, that's about the, the crime that we get. So it is true that tourist areas here in Nicaragua have this small increase in crime, but it's a very specific crime. We don't see, you know, house uh, break-ins are not more common. Um, you know, road rage isn't more common. It's, it's very isolated to people stealing from uh, uh, the tourist most of, of the time. And remember that the majority of tourists that are here uh, are are much richer than the local population. So the chances that they have a lot of money on them or a very significant amount of money to the local population is likely. So a, what would be seen as a small mugging in the U.S., ah, oh, I got mugged, someone got $200. Here is, oh, I mugged someone and I got a month's salary, right? So so what's being taken from one is seen as relatively small and what's gained by the other is seen as relatively large. That tends to make crime a little bit more attractive because even if there's stiff penalties for committing a crime, if the payoff is high enough, it's it's going to make some people willing to take the gamble on that, even though it's it's something that they may not want to do. Um, plus, if there's some level of desperation, and let's be absolutely fair, there are some people, I have not met people who feel this way, but there are people who are very upset with American policies uh, and things that have happened to Nicaragua and do feel that the uh, violations of reparation laws from the International Court of uh, Justice to uh, Nicaragua by the United States are things that Americans owe to the public. And so there is a certain amount of, well, Americans legally do owe this money to Nicaragua. They aren't paying as a, comp as a country. So, you know, I've never heard someone say this, but you can imagine how easy it is to make that leap as an individual to justify your actions if you're specifically robbing people most of the time who are coming from a country who has stolen from your country and is avoiding paying their court mandated uh, reparations. You can see where it's going. But when you have a lot of backpackers anywhere, you're going to have a lot of crime. Backpackers have a tendency to do foolish things, get wildly out of control, and carry a lot of money. And so I know backpackers are like, we don't have a lot of money, but they tend to be moving from place to place for a long period of time and have a lot of cash. And so they're easy targets. That's going to, if you create a bunch of easy targets, you're going to get some crime. However, that crime remains incredibly minimal. And that's what we see here in Nicaragua. These minimal amounts of increase with minimal crimes that happen in those areas. So that brings us to the real question. Well, what about Mexico and Guatemala? They have so many tourists. Isn't it the tourists that's creating the crime there? When we're looking at crime in places like Mexico and Guatemala, it may be tempting to say that, well, it must be these places have lots of tourists. They must have uh, major crime problems caused by the tourists. But this doesn't hold up because areas in these countries that have tourists essentially have no crime. The exception being Cancun, but Cancun proper is not a tourist area. We call it that, but the areas that have tourists are not actually in Cancun, and the areas that have crime is actually Cancun. So that's a little bit misleading. But as you go around Mexico, basically any place that has a lot of tourists, there are exceptions, but basically any place with a large number of tourists has a very small amount of crime. It's not a crime-free country, but much lower than the places in the country that have high crime. When we're talking about high crime in Mexico, we're really centered, especially in the Northwest, uh, in, in areas that are controlled by the cartels. These are definitely not tourist zones and rarely large large cities. There is a lot of crime in Mexico, and that is just a terrible reality going on for them right now. But as a tourist going to Mexico, you really are isolated from that in most cases. Yeah, you may want to be a little bit more careful when traveling on open roads between cities. You definitely want to be a little bit more conscientious of what you're doing, and you want to pick where you're going a little bit carefully based on where there's problems. But even recently, I was in Sinaloa, which is a name that is just associated with all kinds of the worst crime in Mexico. And while being in Sinaloa for several days, I witnessed no crime and had no fear, was able to walk around on the streets, no problem whatsoever. There was no crime in tourist areas, and I went well outside tourist areas and explored old city, uh, you know, regions and walked through parts of the city that were not touristy and zero zero problems and zero concern that I was in a dangerous area. Nothing like Cancun. Cancun is scary, but not touristy at all in any way whatsoever. Uh, so that's a little bit different. Go to Isla Mujeres, one of the most uh, touristy areas. No crime. You don't have to worry about anything. They're like so, so safe. So it's really important to understand that when you're looking at Mexico, even though it's a very touristy country, the areas that have the tourists are, yes, pickpockets, but they are not places that have real crime. And yes, there is some spillover. They are not completely safe from the major crimes that go on there, but they're reasonably safe. Uh, and as I said in some of my safety videos, if you're considering going to places like Guatemala or Mexico as a tourist, even Honduras, which is more dangerous than either right now, 
Generally, as a tourist, you're not going to go to places or do activities that are going to put you in any kind of danger, and you may find yourself in those countries absolutely as safe as if you were a tourist in the U.S. or Canada or somewhere else. The fact that you're in a country where the national average crime is higher doesn't necessarily reflect on you if you're a tourist. Now, if you're here in Nicaragua, as a tourist, your crime uh, risk is about the same as the general population. But if you're in a place like Honduras or Mexico or Guatemala, it's going to be much lower. It's not going to be lower than it is in Nicaragua, of course, but it's going to be much lower than in the general population because most of the, the violent crime, especially that's going on in those countries, is happening uh, within cartels, in cartel-controlled zones, uh, in areas that are fighting against the cartels, and so forth. Now, if we come down to Guatemala, we find the same thing. The areas that are very touristy, Antigua, Lago Atitlan, uh, Quetzaltenango, uh, Tikal, places like that, you have extremely low crime. As a tourist going to Guatemala, you really have no concerns. Maybe on open roads going through, you know, bad areas and even that I'm not aware of any, right? But in theory, you could be up in areas where they're cartel controlled or heavy crime zones, but they're not anywhere near tourist areas. You'd have to be going out of your way to end up at those things. Those aren't things you have to worry about as a normal tourist. And so it's the idea that the tourism is creating the crime completely falls apart in the places that have the highest crime. There's really nowhere that I know of in the world where tourism and high crime rates come together. It is only where there is super low crime like Europe or re relatively low crime like Nicaragua that you have very, very, very slightly localized increases in crime caused by the number of tourists throwing money around and being, you know, often drunk and, and just easy picking targets. But when it comes to national level crime, the more tourists you have definitely does not cause national level crime to go up. If anything, it causes it to go down. And when you have major crime problems in the very few countries that have them, typically those crimes are either uh, caused by uh, major infighting, like a lot of African countries, they have uh, groups that are fighting for control of the country. That creates crime or violence of, of maybe you don't consider crime, but violence that you have to worry about. And if you're in places like Mexico and Guatemala, it is cartels that are fighting. And that is true uh, throughout the region all the way down to like Colombia. And that zone, you have a lot of drug trafficking that creates those problems. So where does the crime actually come from? Well, it, this one's actually pretty easy and very straightforward. The majority of the crime in Central America and Northern South America America, the areas that have the really high crime uh, here in the Western Hemisphere, almost all come directly from U.S. exported cartels and a U.S. funded drug trade. And when we say U.S. funded, that means there's two things. One is that nearly all of the drugs that are being purchased at their end state are being purchased in the United States. So all of this region is simply funding or fl uh, uh, flowing drugs from production zones like Colombia uh, through these are transit zones up to the United States where they'll eventually be sold because that's where the money is being generated to create all this crime. This is basically organized crime uh, throughout this region. All the major crime comes from some form of organized crime, things like drugs cartels would be considered organized crime. They're not like the mafia, but they're not completely not like the mafia either. Uh, so this area is all drug-related major crimes. And there are very few places in the world where it's not either control of the country or something like drug trafficking that creates your big-time crime. We have to look at this really carefully because all of the countries that are involved, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, traditionally El Salvador, but no longer, and Mexico are all closely tied to the U.S., both in proximity, but also that they do a lot of business with the U.S., not just as manufacturing or whatever companies, uh, countries, but also as political partners. All of those have, to some degree, aligned themselves with the United States and been political partners in the zone, and nearly all of them have been directly influenced by the CIA putting drug trafficking into, into those countries because that is used as a way to uh, fund the CIA without oversight by the American people. And no, that is not a conspiracy theory before someone says, well, that's just crazy. That was investigated by Congress. That is the official record. It is a known thing in the United States on the record from the government that the CIA did this and now it's out of control, but they did it through countries that they have these partnerships with and it created this now completely unmanageable problem of drug trafficking and massive cartels with a lot of weapons and a lot of money. So you can directly tie that proximity and partnership with the United States in this zone has created the crime. And in other zones such as El Salvador, which is now at really, really low crime levels, but historically their crime was the highest in the zone, they specifically had had a US-backed civil war 
that had caused a massive migration of El Salvadorian, Salvadorians uh, to California, where they were introduced to these Southern California gangs. That gang culture and cartel mentality was then re-imported back to Salvador when they moved back, and it became basically an extension of Southern California. Of course, the population of El Salvador is very small compared to Southern California, so it was very easy for it to become kind of a satellite of the worst parts of that culture, and it became overrun with that. And so that that's why El Salvador specifically became really, really bad and why they were able to clean it up relatively quickly because they had a very isolated problem to tackle. It was still extremely difficult and we're super impressed by their ability to do that and how well they've turned that around. But that is a recent thing and it was still proximity to the US and in part and parcel with the drug trade that created the problems there. So all of these countries have had a lot of the U.S. getting involved in their politics, pushing those countries to do things on behalf of the U.S., acting, uh, you know, to look the other way at certain times, to allow certain things to happen, to, you know, partner with the U.S. for things that they want and enforcing their policies abroad. And that has brought, naturally, a huge amount of crime and corruption to those countries that they are now tackling. And many of them are tackling well, not all, but some of them are tackling quite well. Some have actually cleaned up like El Salvador, kudos to them. And it is really interesting to see that Nicaragua, who has absolutely stood its ground against the U.S. on all of this and refuses to participate, they strongly block the drug trade through this country. They show that the other countries could block at their borders and are choosing not to, not in the same way, right? Nicaragua has very stringent border controls and it's working and they continue to not allow the United States to guide them in allowing these things to happen or to looking the other way uh, for certain activities. And it is working. Nicaragua has never had. It didn't have to clean up a traditional crime problem, it was able to maintain a reasonably low level of crime. It has improved over time, but even when it was bad, it was nothing like the countries around it because it acted completely differently. It was able to use the proximity to the U.S. still created crime problems here, but its partnership with the U.S. was non-existent, and that allowed it to stay relatively safe compared to all of its neighbors. It still has to deal with spillover crime from all the bordering countries and near bordering countries, except for now Salvador, but traditionally had to deal with that too. We do share a water border with them, so that is a potential concern. So Nicaragua has had to work really, really, really extra hard to stay safe in a sea of problems. Thankfully, our nearby neighbors are cleaning up and this region is getting much better very quickly. We have very high hopes for the region, but that is where the crime is coming from. And it's, so it's definitely not a tourist thing. It is a well-known thing and it is very traceable that it is areas that are cartel controlled. It is where drug trafficking is happening and not where there are tourists uh, that the crime is. So that Nicaragua has low crime, even though it's a decently tourist, I realize it's a low tourist country, but when you look at it with by population and how it was in 2017, we actually had quite a bit of tourists at that time. Crime did not really go up, it, just a tiny bit, right? But it wasn't like a significant thing. So uh, I hope that answers that that postulate that, that perhaps tourism was causing uh, crime. If anything, tourism acts as a hedge against major crime. And the more tourism you have, the more likely you are to be able to either have pockets of or complete uh, riddance of, of major crime problems because it provides such a uh, source of economy that depends on being crime free. Even criminals within countries where you have a lot of tourism, the mafia in Italy, for example, know that if they create any kind of violent problems, it will drive their basic economic base away. And that is not something that works out for them. If you're if you're organized crime in Italy and you want to make as much money as possible, scaring away the tourists and causing a collapse of the economy is hardly the way you're going to collect the most money. So they have a strong interest in many of these cases in keeping the tourism economy strong. And so that requires them to keep violent crime either in check completely or at least from spilling over into touristy areas. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, it would be great if you could share this on social media, tell a friend or family member about the show, spread the word, get someone to watch it, and I will see all of you tomorrow. And if I'm doing my job, we're going to pop up four videos on the screen. If you could just pick one of them and let it play in the background or actually just watch it and participate. And as always, get down and leave your comments below. I'll see you all tomorrow.